So I think we're going to start. Welcome to Mediated Visions tonight um, at the Anvil Theater. We're delighted that you could um, come. Fantastic um, attendance here. I'm your MC. I got roped into it. Uh, my name's Sarah Joyce. I'm the director curator of the New Media Gallery. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> With Gordon Duggan, I curated the Witness exhibition, um, which is on until November 6th, in case you haven't seen it. Uh, the exhibition inspired tonight's program of film, art, and technology. So how did we arrive at this evening? A few months ago, we gathered to discuss how to open the Witness exhibition up to different audiences. We wanted to do something exciting, collaborative, and interdisciplinary, something combining film and big ideas an event that explored how we live in a connected world of vision technologies and surveillance. These are the artists in the exhibition. Um, the first one is Adam Basanta, A Truly Magical Moment. You'll hear from him later on, so I won't describe this piece. It's fantastic. Franz Cadet um, from France. Um, this piece is called um, Do Robotic Cats Dream of Electric Fish? A fantastic little piece. Um, if they do dream of electric fish, what do they see? This is Raphael Lozano Hammer, Surface Tension. Um, one of the oldest works we've shown from 1992, um, and it touches on the biology and mechanics of vision and surveillance. Bjorn Schulke, Vision Machine Number Three. Um, this is a small machine that searches its world. Werner Herzog, um, Doxa immediately suggested when we met um, the new Werner Herzog film, which is all about our interconnected world and watchful technologies, and they'll describe this later on. New West, New West Film Festival suggested Mazdak Garibnevez from Open Media, who's a fervent believer in the power of the internet. And we at New Media Gallery suggested Adam Basanta, one of the artists in the exhibition. His work is all about connecting and seeing, as you'll find out. Momentum Youth Festival organized the phone footage workshop with artist Louisa Fung, who's here tonight, I think. Um, Johanna Bartels offered to create our beautiful poster. All these threads and more have been woven into the fabric of tonight, a series of reveries on our interconnected world. So how will a contemporary art exhibition, a documentary film, and two talks come together in your mind? It is interesting to contemplate what we will take away from this evening. Will it change how you see the world? Will our speakers give us new insights? Will Werner Herzog blow our minds? Probably. Here's the thank yous. I put them up here because I'll probably forget everybody. Um, but I'd like to extend a big thank you to the core team who brought the evening together. Um, sincere apologies to anyone I've missed. A special thanks to Christina Friedrich, arts programmer and project coordinator who's unable to be here and who tracked everything so beautifully. To DOXA, New West Film Fest, Momentum Youth Festival, you've been a joy to work with. To Anvil and theater staff, thank you for making us look good. And to the city of New Westminster, many thanks for your generous support in bringing mediated visions to the Anvil Theater. There'll be a brief intermission after the film, and then we'll return for the two short talks. And I think I have to tell you that um, this event is being um, videotaped. Now I'd like to um, introduce you to two very accomplished women. Kathleen Mullen, executive director of DOXA, Vancouver's Documentary Film Festival, who will share some information about DOXA, and Dorothy Woodend, director of programming for DOXA. Enjoy the film. Hello, I'm Kathleen Mullen. I'm the executive director of DOXA, and this Here is Dorothy. <laughs> 
<laughs> there the she show. is. <laughs> That's Dorothy Wooden, the director of programming. <laughs> We're going to be a tag team. Uh, but I just wanted to just say a very few words. This has been an incredible collaboration uh, for for us. Uh, Doxa. I just, if you don't know it, uh, Doxa is a documentary film festival. We happen every May. Uh, next year's dates are May fourth to the 14th, 2017. It's, we're turning 16, so very important. Uh, we also do year-round programming, uh, which part of that is our motion pictures film series, uh, which uh, this um, is sort of a, a, a part of it. Uh, and we're, we also go to, uh, we're going to West, Van West Vancouver at the K Meek Center on November 7th, on December 5th, sorry. And we, and we do other collaborations with various organizations uh, throughout the year. Uh, so I hope that you will look up our website and take a look at our programming. Uh, but we couldn't have done this, you know, it re really was a true collaboration uh, with the New West Media Gallery and then of course the New West Film Festival um, and also the Anvil Center and it really was a pleasure. Uh, we really want to forge connections uh, throughout uh, the Lower Mainland and uh, it's something that we want to uh, continue to do as an organization and, uh, and please check out the New West Film Festival. It starts on Thursday and it has two incredible films uh, that it's beginning with Closet Monster and Waiting for B. So um, please, uh, there is there a really great film festival here in New West. So, and thank you very much. I'm going to pass it on to Dorothy, who's going to talk about the film. The fun stuff. <laughs> That's Kathleen. Uh, so I'm Dorothy Woodend. I'm the director of programming for DOXA. Uh, thank you for joining us here tonight for the screening of Werner Herzog's Lo and Behold, The Reveries of a Connected World. Uh, so this is a very expansive film. It basically starts at the very beginning of the internet with the very first transmission, which is in 1969 between UCLA, a lab at UCLA and a lab at uh, Stratford University. And the first, very first message, which I won't spoil for you, but it's quite interesting because it kind of sets the tone for what sort of came after. And I was reading, um, before I'd seen the film, I re was reading a bunch of reviews and, and somebody had noted that uh, Herzog had made a film about the internet where he didn't actually talk about porn. So yay, Herzog, <laughs> he's keeping it clean. Well, Werner, uh, when we first came out to the Anvil, I mean, I had no idea that it was out here. So, it, and I'm still, every time I come out, and we've come out for a number of meetings, I'm still just blown away by how extraordinary it is. And specifically the work that Sarah and Gordon have done at the New Media Gallery, it is amazing. So I would encourage you to go and to go often because the work that they're bringing in is world class. It's absolutely mind blowing. So full props to those folks. Good for them. So as Kathleen mentioned, we have a festival upcoming. Our submissions just opened actually on um, September 26th. So if you know some, somebody or if you have a film burning a hole in your back pocket, we're looking and we're looking deep. So please send a, your film to DOXA. And I want to just give a brief shout out to all the people who really were instrumental in making this happen. It's been a very collaborative project from the very beginning. So specifically Sarah, she's been great, and Christina, and uh, Jessica Schneider, and Mike Cooper, who's our tech for tonight, have just been great and so welcoming. And New West is amazing. I really like it here. So I hope you enjoyed the film tonight. And please stay with us for the panels and our speakers following. I'm sure they're going to be terrific as well. And um, thank you. OK, so I'd like to introduce Adam Basanta. Adam Basanta is a Montreal-based artist, composer, performer of experimental music. He grew up in Vancouver. He has a BFA in composition from Simon Fraser University and an interdisciplinary MA in composition and sound art installation from Concordia University. He's prolific. He has won numerous national and international prizes. He likes to work across disciplines and with many different media sound installations, experimental electronic and chamber music composition, site-specific interventions, laptop performance. He just headlined at the New Music Festival here. His composition, sound, and audiovisual installations have been pre presented in festivals, galleries, and institutions around the world. Tonight, he will connect us with the work that is in the Witness exhibition, A Truly Magical Moment. 
Okay, um, thank you very much for the introduction, Sarah. And thanks for uh, coming back after the movie. Um, can we switch the screen? Perfect, thank you. Um, so yeah, so my name is Adam, um, and uh, I created this uh, slightly ridiculous looking object um, called a truly magical moment. Um, and I thought uh, before uh, I really talk about the, the ideas behind this piece, um, I'll just show you a quick video just so we all sort of know what we're talking about um, if you haven't seen the work at the gallery, which you should go and check out all the works in the gallery, by the way. But. Um, so this is a, a, an interactive kinetic sculpture. It was made this year. It uses two iPhones. So it's an interactive kinetic sculpture using two iPhones and two selfie sticks uh, and some electronics. And the basic idea is to recreate this uh, classic romantic scene uh, found in many movies where two lovers, usually the romantic leads, are dancing in the middle of the dance floor and they're staring into each other's eyes and they have this amazing moment. Um, the way this work operates, this is kind of the 21st century version of that uh, dance scene. So um, these are two functional phones. You dial into one FaceTime account and you have somebody that you know or somebody that you don't know dial into the other cell phone uh, FaceTime account. There's me. Uh, when two people are connected, um, the object starts to rotate. And uh, you start hearing this music build up. And as it speeds up and it starts going quite, quite fast, um, it reaches this uh, very magical moment, uh, which feels something like this. So as you can see, the the background blurs or is distorted. All that you see is the face of the person you're FaceTiming with uh, in the phone. That's the only thing that maintains uh, its focus. And this magical moment lasts about one minute, um, and then it slows down and uh, that's it. You disconnect from the truly magical moment. Um, this piece is a little bit different uh, for me. First of all, uh, usually my work uh, is focused on the relationship between sound and technology. My background is in music. So uh, this is a work that, that deals more with vision. Um, and also it uses new technology. Uh, this is uh, uh, some past work from the last uh, few years. You can see I'm using microphones and speakers. Um, so technology, but not exactly new technology. Um, even the speakers that I use, um, often um, I tend to use recycled or uh, reused discarded technology, stuff that uh, is, is reclaimed um, as art, in the name of art, I guess. Um, I also consider myself a technological skeptic rather than a positivist. I probably fall closer to uh, Werner Herzog than, than some of the really, really excited scientists he's, he, he was talking to there. Um, just to give you a... Um, an idea of this, this is uh, my computer that I'm presenting on right now. And uh, if you can see, this is like a time capsule to 2011. Um, it's as if nothing has changed between 2011 and, and 2016 in this machine. And actually, I'm presenting this on uh, iWork 2009, so it's actually even out of date for a 2011 computer. So I can be a, a little bit of a, of a romantic Luddite, probably like Herzog as well. Um, I also work a lot with uh, outdated technologies, um, not as part of my everyday life, but uh, in my artwork. Um, I'm interested in technologies that embody, uh, where, where the flaws in the technology embody this sense of nostalgia, which relates a bit to the use of the iPhones in this piece, because um, as all new technologies, it's aging, um, and there will probably be a time very soon where the iPhone is as outdated as the, this uh, cassette tape recorder, which at one point was cutting-edge technology. Um, 
really. And so, uh, and actually, it probably will happen a lot faster uh, than this cassette tape uh, took to reach that that point of obsolescence. So, with that. Um, you know, sort of context, how did I end up making this work that not only uses current technology, iPhones, but also requires the internet and requires uh, proprietary technology, FaceTime technology, video chat technology, as an integral material. Uh, a material that is not material, but it's still uh, integral to the, the functioning of the piece. Um, well, this was at a time uh, where I was traveling a lot. My partner was traveling a lot as well. A lot of friends of mine were in uh, long-distance relationships. I think the first couple that I knew that met in online dating got married this, this year. So I was thinking a lot about this idea of, of how technology enables communication that was very important in a lot of my sound work. And... Um, and I was thinking, what tools enable these types of relationships that seemed um, seemed new in some way? Uh, and I thought, what is the equivalent of this intimate romantic moment with this kind of lifestyle of creative people that are traveling and don't have to work from home necessarily um, and end up being uh, quite far away from one another physically often? And of course, the, the answer is uh, video chat platforms like Skype, like FaceTime. And I was thinking a lot, uh, kind of like Herzog in the film, about whether this is really a type of connectivity or is this a symptom of a lack of connectivity? Is this uh, a new mode of communication, this extremely happy young doctor? Um, or is this, uh, is this a cheap virtual copy of the real thing, of the face-to-face? -face? Or maybe a little bit of both. Um, I, I think it is a little bit of both. Um, but there is this tension between technology actually bridging physical distance, um, providing a solution, but it's also enabling this physical distance to occur in the first place. It's also uh, part of the creation of the problem. Now, this was just like random thoughts. Um, I didn't have an idea for the piece itself. Um, I didn't think about using iPhones or having them rotate or anything like that. Um, but then I ran into this GIF online. And this GIF inspired the work, as um, ridiculous as that sounds. And I try to come off as a more serious artist in other talks. But, but I just thought this is too funny. This GIF was too funny um, to, to pass up. Um, and I thought, I'll just recreate this Titanic scene, which is spliced with Arnold in this particular GIF, with iPhones. And they'll be spinning, and this idea of romantic, romantic moment and virtuality and just it's going to be so funny. Um, but I'm showing you this GIF for another reason as well, because I think it makes a, an interesting point about connectivity and about the idea of the virtual copy that's really central to this work. Um, because this is not only a, an image or a GIF. Uh, it's a GIF that comes out of a meme, an internet meme, which is a cultural statement that's passed from one individual to the other through imitation. That's a, a meme kind of like a, a gene, but, but uses imitation. Um, and these are the, the sources, of course, but um, the original scene, uh, movie scene is, of course, from, from Titanic. Um, and, and so somebody put this up as a GIF, and then there were many variations. There was a community online that created many variations on this GIF, and one of those variations uh, was the one we just saw, and that's the one that went viral. So it's created by one person, but it's a process of many variations created by many different people who are responding to one another. And this is unique to this kind of connectivity that, that we have uh, in the internet. Um, now, what's interesting, um, and I'm digging deep into GIFs here, which I don't usually do, um, is that this scene is not very original anyway. You know, this is um, lovers dancing in the middle of the dance floor is a trope of romantic cinema. Um, there's lots of examples of it. Um, but this is, for me, the ultimate remake of this type of scene, which appears in other movies. Um, and the reason this scene is so successful is because it allows us as viewers to insert ourselves into the scene to both witness it as this kind of cinematic moment, but also participate in it as it inserts ourselves cinematographically in this point of view um, perception, where we are the other person. So in a way, I think this scene became kind of famous because 
um, and, and remains iconic for at least people uh, in, in my generation who were teenagers when this movie came out, um, because it plays as a copy of our own original experience of maybe dancing in this way. Um, and it's this relationship or, or intersection between original and copy um, that I think where the copy itself is an original variation um, that, that's really unique to this kind of connectivity. It occurs through this community of connected people who each contribute a variation until one of those is successful. Um, now, ironically, the person who made that Conan slash Titanic gif um, probably didn't watch either original movies because those movies were made in 1982 and 1997. Um, and this person is probably... Uh, wasn't born in 1982. Um, so their knowledge of these films is not even a knowledge of the original film that they watch in the theater, but it comes from this shared virtual cultural repository that we call the internet, um, where we sometimes can no longer distinguish between the original and the virtual copy. And, and I'm intentionally using this stock image because if you Google image search original copy into Google image, you will find pages and pages of this image um, with the intersection sign. Um, they'll be in different colors. There'll be slightly different variations. Um, there's no way to tell which one is the original and which one is the copy. And this is kind of a, a feature um, of, of some of the positive and negative aspects of this kind of connectivity. So, so back to the piece. So I'm making this piece, and, and um, I thought, oh, I'm going to create this virtual copy not only of the personal moment of um, you know, dancing in that way, but also it's a virtual copy of our shared cultural experience of that cinematic moment, or of the idea that that is romance. Um, so I was, and I was thinking a lot about this, this relationship between the real and the virtual, um, and how that manifests in the work itself. Um, which became uh, very interesting because the question, where is the work in this piece, where is the work physically located, uh, is not as easy to answer as, as it seems at first. Um, of course, there's the sculpture, um, which is itself an assemblage of different objects that are totally functional phones, nothing has been modified, selfie sticks from the dollar store, like that sort of thing. Um, but this is unlike other sculptures, um, in that we can ask, is the artwork really complete if it's not plugged into the electricity or the internet? Um, if it cannot be used in the way that uh, you saw in the video? Um, is, it, is it the artwork without the, the users or the participants? Um, or is the experience of the work, the participation in it, the actual work? And that's just enabled by the art object, which happens to be in this gallery, but um, you don't have to be in the gallery to participate in the piece. You can call from home or from this theater. Um, and so the art object is just a way of enabling this non-material, non-locative experience in the sense you don't actually need to be in the same location as the, as the sculpture. And I think if, if we do think, and I do think that this experience is at least part of the artwork, then we need to include many other elements in the work. Um, cue another stock uh, image. Um, so the art is distributed, yes, over the sculpture, over the users, but also over the network. Uh, so something like bandwidth is an artistic element here. Um, the space between the phones and the satellite. Every time, you know, if, you, if somebody is texting with somebody else in this theater, it literally like goes to a satellite and comes back into this theater. Um, of course, we saw images of storage space, of servers, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are a lot of material elements, um, material manifestations of this network which doesn't seem material, including um, I was once at a very remote location in BC and uh, uh, the internet was very, very slow there always because it's a very remote community. And uh, some days it didn't work and I asked why and they said because it's cloudy, uh, because the, the, the rays can't like penetrate the clouds. So the internet is very physical and, and here it um, the, the work is distributed over this, this large um, network of, of materials and, and uh, frequencies, etc. So this sense of distribution of what is the work and, and how is it spread out over all these different elements um, 
And the relationship between the real and the virtual copy, I think, relates very much to the theme of the show, uh, which is witnessing. And I, I encourage you to, to go to the gallery and spend time with, with each of the four works, because they all uh, explore this in a slightly different way. So, so who is witnessing this work? Um, or what are the multiple levels of witnessing? Um, we can think about witnessing in the sense of the person that's experiencing the work, meaning the person looking at their phone, whether they're at the gallery or not, witnessing their own virtual experience. And in this piece, you need to have two of them, so you already have two different witnesses. Um, there's also the person in the gallery that's watching the sculpture rotate while the participants are not actually at the gallery. So they're witnessing this participation as, as a third person. Um, it's been very interesting in this gallery, especially with school groups, where, um, where you have two people who are participating in the piece, and then you have people who are witnessing that. They're kind of like looking over the shoulder to see what's happening. And then you have sometimes people who are taking pictures of the people who are on their phones with the experience. Like, they're not taking a picture of the sculpture spinning. They're taking a picture of the people who are activating the work. So, so we have a few levels of witnessing, and this is maybe a little bit less relevant in this piece, but certainly some of the other works in the exhibition, um, uh, I think, speak to this very strongly. Is there a sense where the phones are witnessing one another in some basic level? You know, the, the phone auto-focuses on the other phone that it's facing, um, and um, the phone knows that it's connected to a caller from somewhere in the world. So in a very, very basic level, and as I said, I think some of the other works um, play on this even more, um, the technology is witnessing us participating in the work. Um, an original idea that I never really did in this piece was that whoever calls their IP address would be published online, um, which I never, I never really did, but, but that would be an example where the technology is witnessing um, us participating in it. And I think all these levels are, are sort of in place simultaneously in this work, and that's why it's, it's, it's become a very, very interesting um, uh, uh, piece for me where, where I feel like it's operating on these, on these multiple levels. Um, I want to sort of close with, um, with a, a, the last element, uh, which is the title. Um, this relationship between sincerity and irony in the work and how this relates to connectivity and how this relates to virtuality. Um, so I think it's pretty clear for most people that, that there is an irony in the title, um, the capitalization especially. As you could see from the video, the moment itself that you experience um, is n as a virtual experience, as this virtual copy of the real thing, it's not nearly as truly magical uh, with capital T, capital M, as, as the actual experience of dancing with somebody you care about. Um, and I've always felt this about telepresence, um, uh, the idea of, of video chatting. Um, that it, it, of course, allows so much in terms of communication, but it, it's never really replacing um, the, the, the real thing. And in fact, uh, I always feel that there's, as much as there's telepresence, there's a sense of tele-absence there. Um, personally, maybe this dates, dates me a little bit, but I, I feel like talking on the phone is more intimate than video chatting with somebody, because I'm not holding them at a distance. I'm kind of like nestling them between my shoulder and, and my face, you know? And, and I, I don't know if that's just a romantic thing that, that I have, or, or if there is something in the gesture, but um, all this to say that is this moment truly magical, is it the more convenient, more affordable, more mobile uh, replacement of the original, uh, which the technological positivism um, promises us? The answer for me, of course, is not, or at least it's not magical in the same way. Um, so in this sense, uh, the title is full of irony and the work is, is this ironic statement. But that doesn't mean there isn't some sincerity in the title, because um, although the work enables this virtual connectivity, it actually relies on a very physical connectivity uh, for, for it to operate, for it to take place. And this physical connectivity is one that we are usually unaware of or usually in denial of. You know, so I go into the Apple store and I buy an iPhone, um, but where does this iPhone come from? And how many people were connected in the process of having this phone arrive in my hand? Um, so that I can use it in this uh, funny joke art piece. Um, well, some people were working in this copper mine where the copper is mined to create the circuit boards. 
this is one of the largest copper mines in the world. It's, it's a very big operation. Um, not all of the operations that result in the iPhone are quite as high tech. Um, these are, are people mining for tantalum, which is a really rare chemical. It's used as a non-corrosion element. So um, it's used in, in a lot of uh, mobile devices. Um, you can see that this is nowhere near the same technological sophistication, um, and yet it's essential in this product. And, and in some way, I'm connected with these people uh, who who've, were part of this, creating this and getting it to me. Of course, the people assembling, um, and all this stuff has to be shipped from point A to point B and back to point A and back to point B, raw materials, finished products, um, et cetera. So in a sense, having this very elaborate pathway from the mine through the shipping and assembly, all that to my hand, it's a very complicated process to create a, a very complicated object that is amazingly affordable. I can still afford to buy it. Um, and then I can actually video chat with somebody in the other side of the world. I mean, think about all the people that build the satellites and all this infrastructure that has to take place for this to work. It, there is a sense where this is amazingly magical. If, if we didn't have the technological explanation, this would be magic. Um, and in this sense, the, I think the iPhone, the more, the more I, I look at this piece and, and I think about this, this object aging, you know, and the iPhone will not forever be relevant um, as like an everyday object. I think it's a great case study in that it provides um, this amazing virtual connectivity that still does not live up to real connectivity, to real face-to-face -face connectivity. While on the other hand, it's a manifestation of a global connectivity that as a user I have uh, no idea about or that I, I choose not to have any idea about. And hopefully when people encounter this type of work, um, and, and some of these issues, of course, not, not all of them come to the forefront right away, but, but some of these issues of where the work is and who's participating in it and what does it mean to participate and what does it mean for this to be an art object um, and where did these phones come from, um, these issues of connectivity and virtuality and copies and global economy come slightly into our awareness, whether in a specific or vague way. And this process of becoming aware is in itself a kind of magical journey that extends outward from the art object outside of the art gallery and, and uh, uh, far beyond that. Um, so that's where I'm going to end, and I think uh, we're going to have a really interesting presentation next. If you have uh, questions, we'll, I think we'll have a Q&A after. And uh, so uh, you know, use the telepathy helmet from the film to write it down. Thank you. It's an excellent talk. Thank you, Adam. Um, please welcome Kathleen Somerville, the New West Film Fest director, who will introduce our next speaker, Mazdak Garabnevez. So I just would like to introduce our special guest. Um, I don't want to pronounce your name wrong. I'm sorry. Mazdak. Garab Navas, and he's with Open Media, and I don't have your bio here, so just please come up and talk about uh, technology. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Mazdak. I'm from Open Media. Does anyone know? Has anyone heard about Open Media? A few people. Cool. Uh, so we are a nonprofit um, dedicated to working to keep the internet open, affordable, and surveillance free. And I decided to keep things light by talking about um, government surveillance. So uh, strap in and uh, have uh, have some fun because things are going to get a little bit heavy. Um, So uh, just as uh, before I begin, I just want to say that most of this presentation is kind of based on <clears throat> uh, Glenn Greenwald's book, No Place to Hide, that goes into the, uh, um, all the revelations that came out of the uh, NSA, the National Security Agency leaks, um, 
And you know, all the quotes and all the slides that I'm about to show are you know, top secret slides that were leaked. And, um, and so if, if you'd like to learn more, I would highly recommend this book. Um, so who's heard of Edward Snowden? <laughs> Most people. Um, so Edward Snowden was a uh, NSA uh, contractor. Um, he worked for Booz, Booz Allen Hamilton um, for uh, doing basically intelligence work. Um, he worked in NSA, CIA, many different places, and um, the things that he saw made him decide to leak uh, a lot of documents. And <clears throat> from, that, from that leak, we basically gained a huge understanding on, on what is happening in the world um, through the use of internet. Um, many awesome things happen with the internet, Many bad things happen with the internet, and it's kind of up to us to, um, to make sure that it, things don't turn out too badly. <laughs> so um, when we talk about government collected data, generally it falls under two categories. Content, which is basically if you call someone or if you send an email, say, hi, how are you? That's the content, the, the message. Um, there's also metadata. We heard about that in the, in the movie. Um, metadata is basically um, data about data. It tells you uh, who's calling who, uh, what's the duration, um, you know, where you're calling from, all the, all the quantifiable number type of things. Um, so, because of that, you can tell that content is, because of its um, unstructured nature, it's harder to analyze. Whereas metadata, it's very easy. Plug it in, you have all the numbers, plot everything, analyze everyone's lives. Um, it's, uh, metadata is basically like having a, a private detective follow you around. Um, they they stay back so that they can't hear what you're saying, but they see where you go all around town. They uh, see who you're talking to, how long you're talking with them. Um, so that also uh, enables them to uncover um, additional facts that you wouldn't from content, right? Um, when you're catching metadata, you're catching the data of the person that you're looking at and the persons that they're interacting. You're basically hitting everybody. Now let's talk about uh, what types of data breaches there are. Um, the NSA, which is the National Security Agency, um, they're the main intelligence of, of the United States, um, grabs data in, in three different ways. Um, the first way is the direct intercontinental fiber optics cables. Now, basically with internet, there's huge cables that run under the oceans. They direct all the information between continents. Um, and they've basically devised ways of grabbing data directly from those lines. Um, they also cooperate with telecommunications and internet companies. Um, they make agreements to put back doors inside of um, major companies and grab data that way. And the third way is, um, I think it was discussed a little bit in, in, the, in the movie as well, which is malware inject, injection. Um, they send you a suspicious email with an attachment. You don't know, you click on it. Um, your computer now has something on it that um, basically directly feeds data to the NSA. Um, and I should note that I'm, I'm going to be talking a lot about NSA and the United States, but this is really about all governments, right? The NSA uh, relies heavily, for example, on the five I's. Um, Canada, uh, Great Britain, US, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, right? Those are the, the, the big five guys that uh, really <laughs> work together a lot. Um, So the first revelations that came out of the NSA leaks was actually about telephones. Um, it was 
the FISA court, um, which is basically a rubber stamp secret court that just says, um, you know, similar to that, dear Verizon, please give us all the data on all of your customers, whether they're in the United States or outside of the United States. Um, thanks, bye. <laughs> that was me translating it from legal speak. Um, the, the FISA court, it's also really interesting because um, if, if any intelligence agency within the United States, for example, wants to um, surveil Americans, they have to go to the FISA court and get a rubber stamp, so it's, it's just a process they go through. Um, if you're not American, there's not, there's not anything. They can, just, they can just do it. There's no, there's no mechanism. Um, so that kind of sends a message to the world that Americans apparently are the only ones deserving of uh, privacy. Uh. <laughs> um, so Boundless Informant is a tool that uh, the NSA has had for a long time, and they've gone in front of Congress and testified that um, they have no idea how much data they're getting. Um, they can't estimate the, how much they're collecting. And actually, Boundless Informant is the tool that they created so that they know exactly that information, right? So if you look at that number on there, the 3 billion 9, 95, uh, that's in one day combination between um, telephones and, uh, and electronic surveillance for just one of the subsections of the NSA. The NSA has thousands of different agencies under it. And actually, to, towards the left, um, the 97 billion and 127, that's, that's in one month of just this one agency. So you can see that there's, uh, there's quite a bit being gathered, and they know ex the exact amounts. Um, also, what's ironic is that those numbers are actually higher um, than the amount they collect from, for example, Russia or Mexico, or EU. Um, so they're collecting more from their own citizens. Um, so I mentioned the, uh, the fiber optic cables. Uh, these are the direct cables. That, that's the, the most direct way that you can grab data. And they do it by partnering with, um, with Corporations, basically, uh, AT&T, Microsoft, Verizon, Motorola, huge guys. Um, they form cooperation agreements and um, basically get direct access from the main line. Um, and that's the main way that they grab it from there. Leveraging unique key corporate partnerships to gain access to high-capacity international fiber optic, optic cables, switches, and or routers through the throughout the world. By the way, these are all direct, like internal NSA direct documents, so they had, they had no problems just kind of spelling it out what it is amongst themselves. PRISM, this is, uh, this is probably the, one of the most famous one um, out there, which is basically the internet companies, the big guys, Microsoft, Google, Google Yahoo, Facebook, Pal talk, I don't know. <laughs> uh, YouTube, Skype, Apple. Um, they basically all kind of made an agreement with the NSA and they said, we're going to give you a back door into all of the data that we collect. Um, and, uh, you know, you can kind of do whatever. You don't have to, like, contact us in any way. You don't have to, like, get, present warrants. You can just kind of directly um, search our databases. And that's, that's how that was. Um, and yeah, you can collect all sorts of email, chat, video, photo, um, all sorts of different things, file transfers. What does your social network look like? What are you doing today? Um, which makes a picture like this a little bit more ominous, <laughs> ominous than, than uh, what it originally looked like. Um, basically, President Obama sitting with, uh, with a lot of Silicon Valley people. Um, X key score um, is the, according to the NSA itself, is the widest reaching tool that they have. Um, this is basically essentially a Google 
toolbar um, where you just kind of search someone, whether by it's, it's their phone number or, e or email or something. Um, and you, uh, you basically get to see everything that they have in their social media, in, um, in their emails, within their chats. Uh, so it, it really streamlined the process for the NSA analysts, you know, so that they don't have to work too hard, you know, just directly to the source with a, with a, um, a Google search. Actually, even real-time browsing, so. Yeah, um, what does looking at someone's social networks say about them? Um, according to the five eyes, um, communications, day-to-day -day activities, contacts on social networks, photographs, videos, personnel and information, location and travel information, so your, your phones have geo-tracking so that um, uh, they can collect that, and kind of map out where you go during the day. And this, this one's just kind of a, I don't know, after, after seeing all the numbers, but this one's a, the sticker shock of 42 billion in, in one month is uh, kind of up there. Um, and once you kind of, once you kind of communicate that stuff like this is okay, then at some point it kind of trickles down. Um, so that the culture of surveillance is more accepted. And you have things like the local police using um, things like stingrays, IMZ catchers. Um, these are basically things that trick your phone into, um, into thinking that your phone is connecting to a cell phone tower, but they're actually connecting to a guy's briefcase in a white van outside. Um, and this isn't really targeted, this is, if it's in a neighborhood, you know, within like five kilometers, it kind of vacuums up everyone's data. And then the police can just say, okay, well, like, let's look at uh, what we have here, right? If there's a protest going on, for example, and the police just kind of set this up, um, maybe they can disrupt people. And actually, um, the Vancouver Police Department was, I think, the first one a few weeks back that... Um, that kind of admitted that they use this. So um, let's do a quick case study. So all the, uh, all the um, capabilities that I kind of described. Let's say I'm a, I'm a uh, NSA analyst and I'm surveilling uh, Kate. And Kate sends a, uh, actually Kate calls uh, Dr. Smith's office to confirm their appointment. Okay, I have the metadata of that. Dr. Smith's office, I can go look up the information of Dr. Smith, who's an oncologist. So now I know that Kate is calling an oncologist for some reason. Um, and then two hours later, she sends an email to, um, to a man, says, uh, I'll see you tomorrow night uh, after work love you. Um, and then I can go and look at the other person's email, and I see that that's not her husband. Um, it's just someone else. Um, now, why am I surveilling Kate? Uh, could be because I'm an ex-partner of Kate, and I just kind of want to see what she's up to. Um, but that's not really far enough because now that you know the other email, you can send you know, a virus in an email, a malware that the other person opens. The malware now gives you access to turning on their webcam anytime you want. So when Kate's there, you can turn on the webcam, get incriminating evidence, and you know, kind of ruin her life. You have that capability as a person sitting behind the desk. Does that actually happen? Kind of. Actually, um, I think the cash for activists and journalists is kind of my, 
<laughs> my favorite there. Um, so uh, let's talk about the, the NSA itself. Um, like I said, there's kind of been a change of culture with surveillance. We've gone from a point where we said this is a necessary thing um, for security, and they're still trying to push that. But these leaks kind of showed us that this goes way beyond that. Um, the motivations here are not security driven. Um, you can actually see that uh, in NSA, they employ 30,000 public employees, but 60,000 private, se private sector contractors. That means that they've created uh, their own industry worth billions of dollars. So they have an incentive to make that industry keep growing because they're all kind of making money in that industry. 70% um, of NSA's budget is spent on private sector. Um, they even boast about it, serving our customers. Um, <laughs> the customers being, for example, departments of treasury and commerce. Um, so, you know, departing from the, from the national security narrative, you can clearly see that there's also a lot of, for example, economic espionage, right? Um, this is a memo sent um, about an economic summit that they used NSA intelligence at. Um, what we received from NSA gave us deep insight into the plans and intentions of summit participants and ensured that our diplomats were well prepared to advise President Obama and Secretary Clinton on how to deal with contentious issues. Um, so that would, that would give an enormous advantage to, to people who are negotiating because they know what the other side is already thinking. Um, and of course, you know, U.S. isn't the only one. Canada is one of the five eyes. They proudly boasted in, uh, in their internal documents that they spied on uh, Brazilian uh, mining ministry, for example. Um, and that's, that's purely, that's not for national security reasons, that's purely for economic espionage. This one, this one kind of blew me away because it seemed like something out of uh, the Cold War, which is uh, if you were to live in Brazil, for example, and you were to buy a, uh, a Cisco router and they try to ship it to you, the NSA has a program in place where they would intercept the shipment, open up the shipment, put in some sort of a chip or, you know, uh, whatever, um, carefully pack it back up and uh, send it on its way. That way they would have a direct hardware access to all the data that that, that piece of hardware uh, produces, which I was actually blown away by this. Um, there's also diplomatic espionage, um, any sort of... Um, diplomatic negotiations, you have a complete upper hand in uh, what you want to accomplish if you know exactly what the other people are uh, going to do. Um, I actually really like the quote on this one. Um, Signal intelligence helped me to know when the other permanent represent representatives were telling the truth, revealed their real positions in sanctions, gave us an upper hand in negotiations, and provided information on various countries' red lines. It kind of reads like a, uh, like a Amazon product review. Do you get that sense? Where it's like, five stars, thanks, NSA. <laughs> um, yeah, and actually with those, uh, the, in the rest of the documents, you can see that a lot of the targets of diplomatic espionage are um, you know, important, valuable people, financial industry leads, aid organizations, um, energy companies, EU and UN officials, oil and finance ministers. Um, and actually, uh, 
one of the one of the more famous ones was uh, uh, when they hacked the the phone of Angela Merkel, who's the Chancellor of Germany, um, and that came out. Uh, they weren't too too happy about that, but uh, Germany's not one of the five eyes, so deal with it. <laughs> um, and the NSA itself doesn't really mince words. They're not, they know exactly what they're doing, right? They kind of boast about it clearly in their internal um, memos. It's kind of money, national interests, and ego together. Um, the fact is that the, the internet, when it was created, it was created um, with the intent to give a lot of influence and power to, to Western countries and the United States. And um, so now it's kind of the threat today to them is kind of everything that might destabilize that system, right? It's the, the, um, the motivation is to kind of keep the empire going. Um, I think I've been going a little too long, but I might speed it up here a little bit. Um, just, uh, just quickly about the, the harms of surveillance. Um, when, when we know that we're being surveilled, uh, we act differently. We're bec we become fearful and compliant. Uh, people radically change their behavior when they know they're being watched, um, and they conform with expectations. Uh, what begins as deeply invasive becomes normalized, transformed into usual state of affairs, and no longer noticed. People also think that um, the act of avoiding surveillance in and of itself would generate suspicion. And people that don't really comply, um, well, you know, good thing we have all these tools to uh, deny, disrupt, degrade, and deceive. Um, this is this is straight from the uh, the United Kingdom uh, GCHQ, the Great Britain. Um, you know, discredit a target, set up traps, or um, stop them from communicating, or uh, you know, make their computers stop working. Uh, I want to quickly just talk about Stanza's um, piece, who was here, um, and it's kind of about. It's, it's the, it's a, sorry, let me pull up the, my notes here. Um, so it, it's 48 cameras hooked up to a live database that take pictures of, um, of cars and their license plates, and they, in real time, pull up um, the time of that picture, the car, the registered name, the location, um, and then there's kind of a, a robotic voice that's telling you these things. Um, and at the end of it, they, it kind of finishes it with a little fact or, or a little story about them, which is totally made up from, from what I understand. Um, but it kind of gives you the creeps a little bit to know that, that if, if all these capabilities are in place, um, there is something that, that might be able to do that at some point. And that leads to artificial intelligence. Um, the only limiting factor to, to a state surveillance like this, um, they can grab all the data that they want. Um, the only thing that limits them is manpower, right? If there's 250 protesters tomorrow and you want to learn everything about them, you need to find like 250 NSA analysts to look, at, look over their entire lives. Um, or you can create an artificial intelligence centralized, communicates very fast with everything, puts everything together, and um, the next thing you know, we're kind of on the realm of sci-fi a little bit, where, uh, did anyone watch uh, Tom Cruise's uh, Minority Report, uh, that movie, kind of pre-crime, that, that, that idea of thought crime, you know, if you're at, the, at some place and you can't explain it, a, a machine can put together those, those pieces of information and, and think that you're a criminal. Um, so we should, we should start having those conversations um, when we talk about AI. So let's end it on a positive note, though, because um, I did come here to, uh, in, in capacity as a privacy advocate. Um, what you can do right now, 
and these are starting from like the easiest and going to the hardest. Um, put a tape on your webcam. That's the easiest thing you could do. It, it actually really works it, because that's something, someone can hack your webcam easily. Um, pick strong passwords. Use a password manager. I didn't, I didn't do this for a long time um, until I started working at Open Media, actually. And it saves all your passwords. It's really easy. You just need to remember one password for all your passwords. Um, use two-factor authentication. Uh, so every time you log in, you get a text message or, an, or to, uh, text message to your phone, and then you log in through that. Um, use encryption. Um, if there's things that you think shouldn't be out there about you, um, use uh, encrypted email. Uh, pretty good privacy or PGP um, is very good. Uh, we use it at work. Uh, Signal or other apps for messaging. Um, and Reset the Net and EFF, which is the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, have great resources for that. Um, you can also use a virtual private network or a VPN, which basically says, um, my computer is not in this location. It is halfway around the world. Um, it basically masks where you're logging into the internet from. And finally, um, get active politically. Um, become a privacy advocate. There's not, um, that sounds more daunting than it is, but really educate people. Start having these conversations. Um, if, if you're not okay with any of the things that I said tonight, um, consider what you can do to make a change. Um, in the, in uh, last year, we had over 300,000 Canadians raise their voice against Bill C-51, which was kind of Canada's version of um, expanding our surveillance powers greatly. And um, that became an election issue, and, um, and now the, the government is actually consulting, and um, they're actually cons consulting right now. Like yesterday, they, were, <laughs> they had a town hall in Vancouver. Um, so if there's anything that you take out of it is these two sites, because it tells you exactly what we're doing um, and what you can do to help, saveoursecurity.ca. Um, it gives you, uh, we've basically made a very easy to use, um, in-depth tool for contributing to the consultations against C51. Um, it gives you a lot of talking points. You can copy and paste a lot of stuff and you can send it directly to them um, using the tool. Uh, it just emails it. And um, privacy plan, which is our basic kind of foundations for how privacy should go in Canada. We created this plan with uh, over 100,000 people. I have, a, I have a hard copy if you want to check it out. Um, but you can find the whole thing at privacyplan.ca. Uh, 100,000 Canadians helped us write this. And um, it's, it's substantial, and you can learn more about it. So um, I'll conclude with that, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Mastak, for the dark side of the <laughs> internet. Um, we're right at uh, five after ten. We could have a few questions um, if Adam and Mastak wants to want to sit here. Um, so, if you'd like to stay and ask a few questions, we would welcome that. Um, we've got some microphones here. One thing I noticed: you talked about those five guys. That's Australia and England and us and the U.S. Yep. and that's all of them. New Zealand, Australia. New Zealand, right? Those are all white countries, okay? I mean, other countries are in the. There's not India's not in it, Germany's not in it, France is not in it, Scandinavian countries aren't in it. Right. These are all like America and its friends. Yeah. So this is all like the people who are working there. These are all American and its friends with all American and its friends' values and worries and concerns. And yeah, they're worried about, the, they're worried about losing empire, and they're also worried about who their girlfriend's talking to. Um, so this is almost like, say, Nazi Germany, where you've got to have your papers all the time, or East Germany with the Stasi, where they're like, you're all on record. So is this kind of what we're looking at? But the, the one thing you mentioned, the, the, the 
the stanza exhibit in there, the one, I see that a lot, and there's tons of data coming in there, but it's so much of it, there's a torrent, and you can't really make any sense of it. Yep. There's tons of it, and you, you've got to have an intelligence that can sort it out and tell you this is going to be a problem. And the little stories that they tell, they might be wrong. They're all really dark stories. You're going to die soon. You're not going to get your pension. You're going to get arrested. You're a terrorist. We're going to shoot you. You're drunk. We're going to arrest you. And nothing happy ever happens in these stories. Um, it just, it all looks pretty bleak and everything. And it's like we're building the worst kind of empire, or the people in charge are. Well, um, one thing I would say to that is, luckily we're, especially us, uh, Canada and the US, are probably in the position best to, um, f you know, talk out against um, such huge privacy uh, um, kind of, I don't know the, the, the best way to put it, but, but uh, we value our privacy a lot more than many other countries. Um, and actually, if you look at political pushback and public pushback that's coming, a lot of it is generating, especially from Canada and in the US. Um, and, you know, we, we still have democracy, we still have democratic systems and institutions that work. And um, I, so, so I think, yes, you could see it in a bleak way, but um, we've also seen a lot of progress. And I'm personally optimistic that I, we're in the best position to be able to affect that change. I don't want to monopolize the conversation or nothing, but it looks bad now, but this isn't anything new. I mean, J. Edgar Hoover had a file on everybody. That's right. Um, just as a dumb example, there was a movie set in, this is like an entertainment type film, was set in um, an Air Force, an American Air Force base in Manitoba. And it's a throwaway line, the guy from Washington who comes to solve the problem, this person they had a file on a dairy farmer. And nobody thought this was funny, and like the FBI would have a file on a dairy farmer who lived close to an, an American Air Force base in Manitoba. And this is, I thought like, there's your surveillance state. There's literally anyone who could possibly be a problem. We've got a file on you. Now as it turned out, the conclusions they drew were completely wrong, and there was a rational explanation that nobody saw because they were looking for trouble. Right. And they said, you're obviously, you were obviously watching these planes because you're a spy. And it turns out there was a much more, there's a rational explanation sort of thing, but this, what we're seeing now is just the net, the latest step in a distrust or a mindset that's always been there. Right. And as you say, something you got to watch about, be, yep. care, be careful of, because it's just going to get bigger. We're just going to hire more people yep. to do this. Anyway, just want to make that point. And sorry, well, I, I won't talk. Oh, no. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Joe. Any other questions? I wonder, the two of you together, I mean, you, you presented such different uh, pictures of the world. And I was wondering, were there any quest sort of questions that you would like to ask each other? Um, yeah, actually, um, one thing maybe you can talk about is uh, how you think have you ever had an experience where you were trying to do something creative or create something artistic or, um, you know, create something and someone was watching everything that you were doing? Can you imagine that? Can you think about how that would affect your creativity, how that would um, change the way you would act and what you would produce? Uh, I'm not sure if that's ever happened to me. Um... I, I do think um, you know I, I think my own view of, of technology or our relationship with technology is, is one um, which is not uh, not a technological positive outlook but also not um, the the polar opposite of that right this kind of fatalistic uh, worldview um, even though I, I, I think 
lots of things are terrible, and of course I'm, I was aware of some of these uh, these these things before. But um, but I, I always find a little bit of um, solace in the incompetence of humans and machines, technology, you know, and um, and and so when I'm working with technology. Um, I think that's why a lot of my projects have this um, internal uh, circular logic or you know, machines that are useless in some way. The, 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 their, their operation is manifesting their, their uselessness or the, the, an element of that. And so um, I definitely feel like when I am working with technology, it's important for me not to be a cheerleader for technology, for a particular company, or for um, uh, even the lifestyle itself. You know that, that um, my my job is to kind of to bear witness to these advancements which are happening, whether I like them or not, um, and to kind of find these odd moments that where the technology seems almost human or the humans seem almost mechanical or there's something something funny there or something ridiculous about it or absurd and to and to highlight that because that sort of mirrors the way that I um, that that I feel about technological advancement um, so so it's not really motivated by somebody spying on me but it's more motivated um, by the fact that hopefully somebody is looking at the art at the end of the day. <laughs> And so, and so, I do. I do want it to mirror my own, um, uh, you know, ethics in the larger sense of, mm. of, of how I think things should should operate. Um, yeah, I, I had a question also for you, and um, and and I wonder, uh, uh, like, one solution is to um, create this this. Uh, zone of privacy, right? Like there are these uh, things you can do to disguise your identity online or, you know, make sure there's stronger protections. Um, is another strategy uh, would be to to spam? Like, you know what I mean? Like if, if in a sense, like the less information you put about yourself online, the easier it is for an algorithm or an analyst to determine what the patterns are. Is uh, you know the the oversharing uh, that we usually think of as as negative, like you know posting stuff all the time and and, and all that. D d does that have this kind of um, uh, f could it have an effect where it it actually is clogging the system, not just in the sense that you need more man hours yeah. or new technology to decipher it, but that that there's so much material that is contradictory that. The, your identity is is so contradictory online that it the the analytical tools are no longer useful mm. um, that is that's an interesting perspective uh, honestly i I'd have to go with kind of the obvious thing that comes to my mind is that I think whoever's kind of looking at it isn't really double checking whether uh what you say today is like consistent with what you said yesterday or not, but whether you said something that they can kind of connect the dots. Um, to, to a pre-existing narrative yeah. that they have in yeah. one kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, if, if like one day you were to say this thing is great and the next day say this thing is terrible, the same thing is terrible, um, maybe they'll just look at something is terrible, and then, then kind of form their own narrative around that. Right. Um, that would be interesting to see, you know, when artificial intelligence gets created, whether that would affect them in any way. Because um, I think human error is really uh, high when it comes to these yeah. things. There's a lot of um, uh, kind of bias, uh, personal bias and, and whatnot that would affect it. So that that would be interesting. Uh, I haven't heard of tools that that seek to do that though. <laughs> Maybe you should collaborate with someone and come up with that. Well, I I always think like uh, uh, like 
bots, you know, like, uh, I mean, most of my encounters with like s surveillance um, is, is uh, companies spying, you know, because they want to sell me something. They want to, yeah. they want to determine my, my uh, consumer profile, yeah. which of course can be shared later with other agencies. But, um, but yeah, I, I always wonder if like all these bots and all these technologies, if there's like some sort of way of like, just like turning it around, uh, uh, y you know, c can you use spam bots to spam uh, Justin Trudeau to, uh, uh, and his cabinet to uh, uh, overturn uh, Bill C-51? Like if you can use these technologies like for your own pur for for the yeah, right purpose yeah. in the wrong way. Sort there's of also, thing. there's, there's some these poetic justice. bots. That right. Are, yeah. That are kind of like talk to you and, and try and mimic the way humans talk to each other. Um, if you put two of them and they start talking to each other, things just go a little bit nuts. Like <laughs> if you, there's videos of these things, and if you, if you watch the results of it, is uh, it's very funny. So um, I'd recommend that if anything else. <laughs> Thank you so much, both of you. That was fantastic. I um, really like to uh, a round of applause. And thank you so much for staying and, and coming to the event. It was a great event. I enjoyed it so much. And uh, yeah, wait until the next one. Yeah. Thank you.